You're listening to The White Rabbit, conversations on the art of presenting in a rather noisy world. Your hosts are Matt Krauss and Albert Rosanes. Matt helps leaders of international companies speak, write, and present with confidence. Albert is an author, communications trainer, and a startup investor with a diverse portfolio of companies in Barcelona. If you like this podcast, please share with your friends and colleagues. Now, on to Matt and Albert for today's conversation. Upper the other day, I was listening to a podcast, and you've, I'm sure you've heard of it before. It's, it's the Two Bobs podcast. Oh, it's, yeah. Oh, yeah. And we're, we're big fans of these two. Our virtual free mentors. Yeah, they don't even know it. They don't even know who we are, but uh, we listen to, listen to and, and read pretty much everything that they put out. So they're definitely our mentors. And the, the episode, the recent episode that I was listening to was about models. And it was about not models as in, you know, a runway on Venice models, but models as in ways of understanding the world, constructs or ways of understanding the world. And they went into a couple models that they use, but their, their main point was to say that models are necessary for understanding the world. And, and another point that they made was that not only are models necessary for understanding the world, but they're one, one person might have 9 million different models. There's no one perfect model that explains everything. That's an unrealistic expectation to have of a model. A model is just, uh, in, in, their, in, their, in their words, a model was just a way to see a problem and know how to look at it or know how to attack it. it, it there was no expectation that there's one perfect model that needs to explain everything in the world and your life is not complete until you find this model. So, so they were talking about models. Okay, it's pretty personal then. Yeah, it, it was pretty personal. It, or it, I mean, they they were they were giving advice to others, and and their advice would be very personal. It was it was whatever your model is, and you should not expect you, the your model to match the models of your competitors. Don't expect this. Just think of what is your model for your own your own way of seeing the world. So yeah, it was very personal. And I was listening to this podcast and thought, huh. Well, you know, I should figure out what my model is. And, and I've been using my model for many years, but I should finally put myself under the pressure of getting out a pen and pencil and writing it down and figuring out what it was. And so I got out a pen and pencil and I wrote it down. And th or the paper. first thing, pardon me? Pen and pencil or pen and paper? Oh, uh, uh, I got a pen and paper. Yeah. So I got a, a pen and paper okay. out. And just, just to be clear that we're dispensing accurate information on this podcast. Yeah. We, we have a, an accurate information policy on this podcast. Yes. So I, I got out a, a pen and <laughs> pen or a pen and paper and I thought, okay, I'm going to write down Matt's model. So this is Matt's model for okay. understanding a large part of his world. Not Matt's model for understanding everything. That's, that's an unrealistic expectation, but just one of the main models that Matt uses. And what I came up with, the, the first thing that came up, that came out of my head was that people have a really hard time getting out of their own heads. That, that was, that's a, a model that, ex, that I use for explaining a large part of what I do professionally. And then they, they mentioned a, another thing on this, on this, on this podcast, this two Bob's podcast. They said, okay, well, your model should not make the world more complicated. It shouldn't make a problem more complicated. If your customer needs you to sit and work out this model, your model's not right. Your you need to be able to explain your model to your customer. And your customer, after a few iterations of needing you around to work out the model, your customer should be able to work out the model on their own, or they should be able to execute the model on their own. They should be able to understand the problem on their own. It shouldn't require you. So with that, I thought, okay. Okay. Well, if I'm sitting, let's say, let's let's imagine that I'm, I'm sitting and I'm talking to a customer and let's call this hypothetical customer, Bruce. I'm sitting with a, a hypothetical customer or a hypothetical client named Bruce. And I'm sitting there in the, in the conference room and I break out this phrase. People have a really hard time getting out of their own heads. And Bruce says, Matt, that's nice. You're very wise and all. You and your mother should both be very proud. But I didn't call you here today to be wise. I called you here today to solve a problem for me. So give me something, give me a, a way to use this tangibly. What, what tangible steps can I take 
to make this framework or to make this model work for me. So that when Matt spouts this model, people have a really hard time getting out of their own heads. Bruce, the client, needs to be able to take that information and do something tangible with it. He needs to be able to solve a problem with it. That's the standard that the model has to meet. So I thought, if that's the standard that the model needs to make. What are the steps that I could give to Bruce so that Bruce could solve the problem even if Matt's not there. That's the definition of a good model. And so I thought, okay. By the, the way, uh -huh. I'm going to interrupt you for a second. Uh, sure. When you say the problem of Bruce, are you, are you just just understand you correctly? Are you saying that uh, the fact that people have a really hard time getting out of their own heads is it a problem that Bruce is aware of about himself, or are you bringing it onto on his awareness? Well, I guess in this case, maybe Bruce thinks it's kind of cool because he hadn't thought of it in those terms yet. But Bruce has a specific problem and he's called Matt for it. And since I'm a, a, a presentation delivery guy, it probably has something to do with presentation. So Bruce is probably trying to solve some sort of problem with presentations or messaging or something like that. Mm -hmm. He's not trying to solve some other problem like how to paint his office door or how to lead stand-up meetings on Monday. So he's trying to solve a problem and he's probably vaguely aware. Like when I sit there and I say people have a really hard time getting out of their own head, it's not like Bruce says, wow, I've never heard that before. That's amazing. Oh my God, this Matt is like God. It, it, Bruce, Bruce kind of knows this. I mean, not as in like Bruce knows that Matt is caught. He kind of knows this model that Matt has just given. <laughs> you would like that, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, of course I would like that. But Bruce hears this and thinks, yeah, Matt, that's nice. It's good to see the world that way. Congratulations. But knowing this model, people have a really hard time getting out of their own heads. It doesn't help me. It doesn't help me, Bruce. It doesn't help me solve okay. the problem that I'm trying to solve. So give me something tangible so I can solve that problem. Take this theory that you have, okay. take this model that you have, and break it down into tangible steps that I can use. That's the according to the, the Two Bobs podcast. That's that, that was the that's the standard that a good model needs to hit is that it needs to have tangible steps that a customer can use. So I continued with my writing okay. a little bit. I continued with my writing and I thought, okay, well, that's great, Matt, that you have this model. I, I played Bruce a little bit, otherwise known as devil, devil's advocate. I, I played Bruce a little bit and I said to myself, I said, that's great that you have this model, Matt, but how do you use it? If you're having this problem, how do you get over it? And so I came up with four steps that you can use to get over this problem of getting out of your own head. And nobody is ever perfectly going to completely get out of their head. I mean, we're humans after mm -hmm. all. There's, there's no way that we can bridge, completely bridge that distance between one head and another head. We can try and there are some great things that we can do to bridge that gap, but we're never going to fully bridge that gap that exists between one person and another person. There's just no way it's going, ever going to happen. So these are, these are not steps that you can okay. that you can use to to perfectly bridge the gap. They're just steps that you can use to get really close and maybe closer than most people to to bridging that gap. So step one is spend half the time describing the way that they see the world. And, and by they, I mean the audience or the other person, the person that you're trying to communicate to, your target audience. Spend half the time understanding the way that they see the world. And ideally, in order to do that, you would you know, walk a mile in their shoes. Um, for example, if you are a software designer and you are designing software for a warehouse, you would work in a warehouse for a couple of weeks. That's the ideal. You would work in a warehouse for a couple of weeks. But in real life, it's rarely possible to do that. I mean, you know, no boss, very few bosses are going to say, oh, yeah, you know, for the next couple of weeks, I don't need you at all. So go, go work in that warehouse for a couple of weeks. No problem. Have a good time. No boss is going to do that. So we need to find another way to get as close as we can to walking a mile in, in another person's shoes. And one way that mm -hmm. we can do that is to ask a third party who knows both sides to communicate to you what are the common concerns. And this person, this third party, in a lot of ways, this is the function that I serve professionally. In a lot of ways, one of the key tools that this person is going to need is that this person is going to need to have a little bit of vocabulary from both sides. This person is going to need to have 
a little bit of software engineering vocabulary and a little bit of warehouse worker vocabulary so that this person can say, and this person is also going to need to have a view of the world that says, if you take two people from different groups, they're are going to be some differences. I mean, the life of a software engineer and the life of a warehouse worker, they're not the same, but yeah. probably about 80% of their professional life is this is largely the same. You know, both sides they feel pressure from their boss, both sides they feel pressure to do something difficult. Like for example, you know, a, a software engineer feels pressure to uh, solve this problem and write code for it before vacation. And the warehouse worker feels pressure to, I don't know, to pick 30 tote boxes per hour rather than 25. So both sides are feeling some pressure. So this third party is going, and this third party is going to, so this third party is going to need to ha know how to speak a little bit of the language of both sides. And this person is also going to need the perspective that even though there are differences, between people. There's also a large commonality between people. And then in that, you have a third okay. party who's going to be able to show you how to bridge the gap between the words that you use to describe the world and the way that you describe the world to the way that a, a warehouse worker describes the world. That's step one is walk a mile in their shoes. Step two is spend 15 to 20% of the time. So if let's say if you're taking an hour Maybe you spend 10 minutes uh, describing the problem using the vocabulary that they use. So describe the problem using the vocabulary they use. And, and here it's important that you don't describe the problem using the vocabulary you use. Describe the problem using the vocabulary they use. That they use. Yeah. Like, for example, um, maybe the problem is that the handheld devices, handheld electronic devices that they use in the warehouse don't show all the locations of an item. And you as a software engineer, maybe you're thinking in terms of words like database and you're thinking in terms of uh, database calls and pings and blah, blah, blah. You're thinking software engineering terms, but those aren't the terms that the person in the warehouse would be using to describe the problem. And that's where the, the, the third party comes in. So, so that's the, the second step is describe the problem using the vocabulary they use. And then the, the third step, and, and this one also takes about, uh, you should, would take about 15 to 20% of the time. So if you're working on, on a presentation for an hour, you know, it's maybe it's 10 minutes or something like that. Um, describe the problem or describe the solution, describe the solution using the vocabulary they use. And, and again, it's, this is where that third person comes in is that you need to be able to describe the solution using the vocabulary they use. So if you're that software engineer, you might be thinking in terms of, oh, you know, database calls and latency and uh, requests and pings and blah, 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 all this software engineering vocabulary. And that's that's not the vocabulary that the warehouse worker would use to describe the the solution. Maybe the oh, warehouse. No. Yeah, maybe the warehouse worker not would adult, use yeah. Yeah, the, the warehouse worker might use words like, you know, orange button on the left, uh, or the warehouse worker might use in terms, instead of latency, the warehouse worker might use terms like wait or wait time, maybe. Or computer and, speed or slow computer. Yeah, computer, computer speed, slow computer, or slow computer speed, fast computer speed, fast response time, slow response time. Maybe the, maybe the, and you would think that those words are tremendously imprecise, but to the warehouse worker, it's a completely accurate and reasonable description of the solution. So that's step three is spend 15 to 20% of the time describing that solution. And then step four is, step four is actually designing the presentation. And that takes, that's about also about 15 to 20% of the time. So if you have an hour, spend about 10 or 15 minutes designing the presentation. And, you know, when I say designing the presentation, I mean things like looking for the right stock photography, you know, arranging stuff on your slides, stuff like that. So you've got these four steps. It reminds me of that quote. I think it was a quote by Albert Einstein, or, or at least at least people attributed to Albert Einstein. It's like pretty much every good quote from the 1900s either gets attributed to Albert Einstein or John F. Kennedy. <laughs> it's like those two yeah, guys, yeah. Spend, they spend nothing, <laughs> but... Or, they spend no time except they own the market. Yeah, they, they they own the market for quotes for like an entire hundred year period. So, but but anyway, the the quote is: If I had an hour to solve a problem, I would spend fifty five minutes understanding the problem, five minutes 
solving the problem. And I don't know, you know, if Albert Einstein actually said that. Maybe it was somebody else. But again, notice that in these four steps, you're only spending, out of an hour, you're only spending 15 minutes uh, actually designing the presentation. You don't open PowerPoint until your th the last 15 minutes, minute 45 of your preparation time. Most of the time is actually spent learning how to describe the way they see the world. So anyway, th those are the four steps. If, if, if Bruce looked across to me in the conference room table and said, Matt, that's nice that you say people have a really hard time getting out of their own heads, but Matt, Give me something tangible, some tangible steps that I can take to solve that problem. Those are the first four things that would come to mind. I get, I, I understand. And I like that the majority of the time spent would be, would be on seeing, trying to see the world from, from their point of view, like taking a walk, walking a mile in their shoes. Yeah. Like and uh, it, it's really important to do that. A lot of the, you know, in our industry, we see a lot of uh, death by PowerPoint, you know, bad presentation. And probably half of the cause of bad presentations is simply not being able to describe the world in ways that other people see it. You know, you've got this audience of 10 or 100 people. Oh, you're absolutely anywhere. right. I would say much more than the health. Yeah. And so you've got these, these people sitting in front of you and you're talking at them and they just don't understand or care what you're, what you're talking about. Maybe, maybe they care deeply, but they don't know it because you've covered it up in so many words that they don't understand anymore. Mm -hmm. So anyway, as, as I was, uh, as I heard this two bobs, as I felt compelled to write down my model and help walk Bruce through it, and I was inspired to do this by the two bobs podcast, this is the first thing that came up, that I came up with. There are a million other models that I came up with after that. There are, there are models that have absolutely mm -hmm. nothing to do with my professional life, but I came up with them anyway. It was amazing how many models we're using. And sometimes we take it for granted and don't even realize that we're using it. So should we point our listeners to, to that episode to, to find out how to come up, how to find, or maybe discover in this case, their own models for, re, for reviewing the world? Yeah, we should, uh, we should totally put that in the show notes, the, the link to, to this pod, to the, to the Two Bobs podcast. We should definitely put that in the, in the show notes. And I don't know if, I mean, you know, one of their points is that everybody's going to have a different model. So maybe they're not dropping any wisdom bombs that are suddenly going to make you think, oh, wow, that's the model that I've been looking for all my life. Maybe that's not going to happen. But maybe listening to that podcast is going to trigger something in you and think, I've been looking at the world a certain way for a long time, and it's finally time for me to put it down with pen and paper. This sounds good. Yeah. yeah. I'll check that out too. All right. So this thank you very good. much. This and I'll talk to you uh, next week then. Thank you. Thank you for the wisdom bomb. And <laughs> I'll welcome. talk to you next week. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. All right, take care. Thank you for listening to The White Rabbit with Matt Krause and Alper Rosanes. You can subscribe to the podcast on Spotify, iTunes, or through your favorite feed.